keep on wishing to be done and missing. Darwin himself was adamant that his theory applied not just to bodies, but also to uh, emotions and perceptions and behavior. Via the brain, of course, which is a part of the body. And by shaping the brain, the uh, evolution can ultimately shape what we think, what we feel, and, and how we act. And this is, in a sense, obvious for some of our most uh, ardent desires and drives. Why do we want to live rather than die? Why do we? Uh, love our children? Why do we like to stay in a moderate range of temperature rather than too hot or too cold? Why do we uh, eat foods that are rich in calories? Why are we afraid of things like heights and dangerous animals and uh, the dark and deep water and not afraid of driving without a seatbelt or a loose carpet on stairways? Things that are statistically much greater threats to our health and safety, but which we did not uh, evolve to, uh, to experience. So these are some obvious things, and everyone would uh, recognizes that, uh, that drives like hunger and thirst and sex and safety are as much adaptations as the uh, <coughs> anatomy of our hand or the functioning of our liver. I think in, in uh, recent decades, this has been extended to aspects of, of uh, human psychology that are not as obvious, such as why do we get jealous? Why is it deeply painful to think about your boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife having sex with someone else? During the 1960s, this was thought to be completely irrational. Maybe we could outgrow it. Maybe everyone could have sex with everyone else and no one would mind. It didn't work out that way. Uh, why, why do we seek revenge? It's the source of so much violence and misery. Serves no purpose, uh, but nonetheless, it seems to be deeply embedded within us. Why do we feel guilt? Why do we feel anger? Uh, why do we have language? I think more recently, Darwin's vision that the theory of evolution would help to explain human uh, psychology as well as human bodies is coming to fruition. There are interesting, exciting, and testable hypotheses on how evolution shaped our minds. Well, before Darwin came around, probably most people's um, intuitive psychology was what has been called the ghost in the machine. Namely, we've got bodies, uh, we have brains, but the brain is just a uh, the, the seat of the soul, the soul being some magical entity that makes decisions without having been physically uh, uh, caused by anything. Uh, and uh, there wasn't any attempt to think of mind, perception, memory, behavior, emotion in physical terms at all. There were theories of uh, associationism that uh, we uh, have a few primitive sensory impressions, colors, sounds, heat, light, um, temperature, and that when things are experienced in close succession, one, re one reminds us of the other. That was the theory of associationism, and that was one of the major theories in, in philosophy and psychology for several centuries. Darwin led people to think that many of the uh, emotions and drives that keep, get us going are, uh, can be explained as um, evolutionary adaptations, that is, things that, compared to their alternatives, increase the number of surviving offspring. And I think there was another revolution that was just as momentous, more momentous, and this was the revolution in computation and information of the late 40s and 1950s where for the first time we had a mechanistic theory of how intelligence could emerge from a physical object. It was no longer magic. You no longer needed a ghost or a soul or, or a spirit. Neural circuitry involved in the transmission and manipulation of information could account for intelligence. You put the two together and you have the idea that the uh, human brain is basically a naturally selected information processor. That uh, unlike computers which are manufactured by uh, humans following the plan of an engineer, the human brain is an information processor that evolved by natural selection in order to 
uh, allow us to manipulate our environment and to cooperate with one another. Uh, yes, uh, as the American framers of the Constitution said, what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? Uh, we need government precisely because of laws in, in uh, human nature. Uh, I think the framers of the American Constitution very often had a fairly sophisticated theory of human nature. Obviously, it wasn't uh, evolutionary because Darwin didn't publish his results until uh, 1859. But intuitively, I think meant they had a good grasp of some of the parts of human nature that only got explained a century later. The fact that people naturally strive for dominance and power, and that this is something that any democracy has to have safeguards against. The fact that people fool themselves about how generous they are, how wise they are, and so you don't let one charismatic leader take over the government, but you need checks and balances. Uh, the fact that people can often prosper despite all of their selfishness by voluntary exchange, and so the government ought to provide institutions that allow exchange to take place. In many ways, I think that the theory of human nature that was uh, common in the, around the time of the Enlightenment in the 18th century um, <coughs> was more sophisticated than some of the ones that came later that went into eclipse, but that have recently been revived in this more biological uh, framework. So an example of a defective theory of human nature would be one that said that that, that, that uh, there are no innate drives, biases, uh, <coughs> selfish uh, motives. And so in a state of anarchy, people just spontaneously living together will naturally cooperate. Uh, I think that's very unlikely to be true, but there have been uh, utopian movements that are, are based on it. The idea that people will naturally share with strangers in the same way that they share with their family and friends and colleagues. The idea that the bond between parents and children is a social construction and that you can have children raised collectively in children's gardens uh, and not have them live with parents and they'll be, everyone would be perfectly happy. Uh, that would be another fallacious theory of human nature that went into the design of some societies like the Israeli kibbutz, uh, which then later got uh, revised as people discovered the reality of human nature pushing back. Uh, so I think there was a, an eclipse. There's a, especially in the first half of the 20th century, there was a um, revival of the doctrine of the blank slate, that there's no such thing as human nature. There's nothing but the ability to associate uh, ideas. Uh, therefore, a social planner can design any society they want and can mold people to fit the optimal society. Well, in fact, this very argument has often been used to defend the doctrine of the ghost in the machine, the idea that we have a soul, that we have free will, uh, often by uh, defenders of religion against scientific approaches to human nature, whether they be uh, on the side of heredity or environment. Because as you note, if you're a hereditarian, you could say, it's not my fault, my genes made me do it. If you believe in the blank slate, you could say, it's not my fault, it's the society, it's culture, it's my parents, it's my socialization. And so that's why often defenders of religion say, it's neither caused by the environment, nor is it caused by the genes, it's not caused at all, it's the exercise of free will, that's who we put on trial, that's who we hold responsible. So I think that this is, uh, is a non sequitur. Uh, for one thing, there's no way to make sense of the notion of purely free will, something that is not caused uh, at all. We know that every aspect of perception, emotion, uh, thinking, decision making has correlates in the activity of the brain. There's no reason to think that there's anything but the brain. And the moral argument that we need a soul in order to find someone responsible, otherwise there'll be unlimited defenses, like the Twinkie defense, I, I, I had too much, too much junk food, that's why I killed the guy. Uh, I, I think that that fear can be put to rest. And the reason is, one of the parts of human nature is these big frontal lobes that have 
vastly grown in the course of human evolution. The frontal lobes <coughs> can uh, anticipate the consequences of behavior, can plan ahead, can think. And one of the things that goes into that thinking is, how will other people react to what I do? If I know that I live in a world where if I rob a liquor store, they'll throw me in jail. If I uh, beat my wife or my children, uh, then I will be punished, I will be shamed, I will be ostracized. That is, if I live in a world in which other people hold me responsible, well, maybe I'll hold back and I won't engage in these destructive antisocial acts in the first place. So holding someone responsible is itself part of the environment. It's a part of the environment that acts on a part of our <coughs> heredity, namely the ability to anticipate consequences of behavior, the ability to inhibit responses. That is a part of the brain that does that. And that's what responsibility ultimately hinges on. Responsibility is a set of rules, laws, expectations, contingencies in the environment that act on a particular part of our heredity, namely our prefrontal cortex. That's right. Uh, we, are, we evolved as social uh, creatures. That's part of the human ecosystem, other humans. We, a large part of our brain, a large part of our mental lives consists of thinking about what other people think of us and managing our reputations and uh, uh, currying favors, uh, avoiding punishment, punishing those who hurt us. We are social creatures and human nature consists of being receptive to what kind of social world we live in. I think there's a component of truth to it, but I don't think we evolved only to deal with other people because there's something circular in that. Why would we deal with other people unless they had something to offer us? Uh, I, I think that three things co-evolved to make humans uh, unusual among uh, primates. And we are unusual. We're, we're very weird primates. We're weird in three ways. <clears throat> one of them, the one that you mentioned, is that we're highly social. Uh, and in particular, we cooperate with people who are not related to, each, uh, related to us. That's very unusual in the animal kingdom. The second is, we talk, we have language. That makes us also very unusual. There's nothing like human language in animal communication systems. And then the third is, we're technological. Uh, you and I are here talking in this grand cathedral of technology, MIT. Uh, we're surrounded by man-made artifacts, and that has been true for as long as we've been human, uh, as long since we used stone tools. We are a technological species. I think those three co-evolved. Uh, sociality may have had to have been in place first, uh, but it wasn't the only thing that led us to have a big brain, because we also developed uh, spears and bows and arrows and baby slings and methods of cooking and methods of extracting poison methods of uh, trapping animals. We're a species that live by our wits. We outsmart other plants, other animals and plants by figuring out how to defeat their defenses. That's very much a part of being human as well. That's one of the reasons we, whenever humans first enter an ecosystem, there's a mass extinction. That's been true for 10,000, at least 10,000 years. And the reason that I think that all three are essential is that each one multiplies the power of the other two. If you're social, then uh, n when you discover something, you not only reap the benefits for yourself, but you can exchange it with others, especially if you have language. Uh, language is a way to exchange know-how. It's a way to cooperate over the long term. If you help me with this today, I'll help you with that tomorrow. That's the kind of reciprocal exchange that's necessary for cooperation to uh, evolve. Information is the ultimate tr uh, trade good because I can confer a large benefit on you at a small cost to myself. With a few seconds of breath, I can teach you, say, how to fish or how to trap an animal. I haven't lost that knowledge just because I've shared it with you. We now both have it. That's a reason that you and I might cooperate and why we, we might be increasingly social. So the social uh, pressure, the technological pressure, the linguistic pressure I, are all part of one complex that explains what makes humans so unusual. Keep on wishing to be done missing, but I guess.
Christmas comes hand in hand with wanting it all. I need sleep. Killed all the sheep.